and you can do one next week um, because it's fortnightly. But um, I couldn't sort of bypass what has happened this week. So, if anybody's uh, aware, the the royalty in Saudi Arabia, one of the people very close to the royalty in Saudi Arabia, has acknowledged the Jewish claim to the Temple Mount. Now, if anybody is not aware of what that means prophetically, it means time is short. Daniel 9.27 tells us that the Antichrist will appear in the midst of a temple, the temple, the third temple. He will appear in the midst of the temple. He will stop the sacrifices. So in other words, there has to be sacrifice and offering ongoing. There has to be a third temple in existence for the Antichrist to emerge. That's why you see people like Trevor who are very tuned in to the watchman approach that their eyes are trained upon Israel because Israel is the prophetic clock but the temple mount is like the second hand going round so if you look at the temple mount and what is happening there and anything that changes now Saudi Arabia have so they publicly done this it was over I think Twitter initially that it was in response to someone look, putting up a picture saying look it's uh, occupied Palestine and they put up a picture of Israel and the Temple Mount. And the response was to say that this is the, 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 the pilgrimage, the home place of Judaism. And whenever the, the third temple is erected, whenever it goes up, there's no, I'll, I'll tell you, it didn't go quicker than that, it go before that. As it's mentioned now, that there's support for it. I'm saying time is so ridiculously short that you have no time to play at this Christian thing. None. I, don't, I want you to be aware of that in this time because if you're looking at what has happened prophetically, I'm going to say that straight away you can see the atmosphere has been terraformed. Now I like to say that word terraform. Right? Terraform is basically when a climate an atmosphere, a, a planet is adjusted to, and the climate is adjusted, and the atmosphere is adjusted to new life. And what you've seen over the last sort of 2,000 years at least, you have seen the terraforming of the atmosphere of the world into the realm of the small g God of Ephesians 2.2, 2, the principalities and parts of this world, the one that we know as Satan. And the reason I'm saying this is because the church has been blind to it. And I want to sort of start off today. We were talking last week about drawing out. God is calling you forth. And as God is calling you forth, he is calling not just you forth into your identity in Christ. He is calling the church forth into their identity, the corporate identity of the church in this world. We're living in a time in which, honestly, the stats would stir you. They certainly have struck fear into me. Not fear of the world, but a reverence to fear of God. 33% of Christian men are addicted to pornography. 33%, a third of Christian men are addicted to pornography. And what has happened is because the church has been asleep, people have went, that's all right. Sure, everybody, everybody's addicted to pornography. Everybody, sure, it's everywhere. You can just go and look at it. It's fine. But the atmosphere of being in Christ changes the person to the very core. And when you get born again, your conscience becomes so on fire for Jesus that you're provoked whenever you do wrong to go, oh, hold on a minute. When I'm in this atmosphere, I take a Christ into this atmosphere. I challenge any Christian man who is struggling with that to remember that you're always in the presence of Jesus, so what you're looking at for your eye gate, you're making Jesus look at. I look at the stats to say, look, 33%, or sorry, 36% of the church, of the church, do not believe anymore in a rapture. Despite the fact that it's, it's mentioned, there's three raptures in the Bible, but there's a promise of a rapture mentioned through the writings of Paul in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, through 1st Corinthians 15, through Revelation, we can identify that the rapture is coming. And what happens, it says in 1st Thessalonians 5, that we are not children of the night to be caught off guard. The thief comes like a, a the, the enemy comes like a thief in the night, 
Right? It says that Jesus also comes like a thief in the night. In other words, it's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen suddenly. And we are sitting blind because the church is saying, no, don't like that little bit of doctrine. I want to share some more stats with you. 33% of Christians nowadays, it's a third, believe that there's more than one way to heaven. Now, that scares me because by even mentioning that, you're not a Christian. If you believe you can get to heaven through Buddha, if you believe you can get to heaven through Muhammad, if you believe you can get to heaven, oh, well, I know I'm going to be all inclusive. Listen, all inclusive does not work when it comes to truth. We are told, and we are told in this atmosphere, that truth is just the same as an opinion. An opinion in Christendom has now risen to the platform of what should be seen as solid truth. I do not care what anybody's opinion is. I care about truth. When Jesus got down in the sand and he drew a line in the sand, that is like saying, look here, this is a solid line. It's not a figment of your imagination. It's not open to your interpretation. When he threw out scripture and he threw out rebuke, he didn't leave it open to your interpretation. He threw it out there. Because the, the problem with this is if you start to lose focus on what is true, if you start to equate opinion over fact, you're left with an idolatry in your life. You're left with an idolatry faith system that is not in the Bible. Forty-one percent of Christians in the UK, people who profess to be Christian, this was done in 2017. Forty-one percent don't believe that Jesus was physically resurrected from the dead. And again, here's the thing: you're not a Christian. If you believe that there's more than one way to heaven, then you're countering the very word of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. If you don't believe that he was resurrected, you're counter in everything that we read in the New Testament. Don't call yourself a Christian. Now this is a hard message to some, but I, I was preaching on Wednesday night in Bible study. And I was talking about the compromised church of Theatria. And I tell you, it had the most polarized results. Because I was getting private messages, people going... Can I join the mentoring team? Can I join with what you're saying? Because I love that and get so much from the Bible studies. Other people, you're a heretic. Literally, right? Telling me that because you're telling the Christian and the believer not to compromise, because you're reading out of the Bible, you're a heretic. Because once you're saved by grace, I'm sure everything's okay for you to do. The problem is, is if you do not grow in Christ, you're growing in something else. I'm sorry, but I'm going to be right down the middle of today because there's no there's no wavering on truth. And the minute that you start to be um, a, to hold opinion over truth, you know, opinion comes from the Latin of panari, and it means to have a thought that is not based in fact. Your opinion—it's just the, there's birds up there, don't worry. <laughs> Your opinion. Of how I look doesn't matter. The fact is, I'm gorgeous. Don't laugh. <laughs> the mirror told me so. No, honestly, your opinion won't, will not get you into heaven. It is the truth. And truth is absolute. It is objective, not subjective. Truth isn't in the eye of the beholder. And what we're living in is a society that says, but go on, tell him your truth. No such thing. Serious. There's no such thing as your truth. There is your opinion. There is your side of the argument. But there's no, uh, there's no such thing as your truth. Truth is absolute. Here's the thing. 91 to 99% of the world no longer believe in the devil. Now that should be scary. What should be even more scary is 65% of the church don't believe in the devil. Now that, that to me rocks me, right? I used to fight for a living. If I got into the ring and didn't believe there was an opponent in front of me, I would be on the floor in no time. Who's hit me? But I need to know the adversary that I have 
If I turn around and I say that, that there's no such thing as the devil, then I'm calling Jesus Christ a liar. I'm calling every apostle, every, every prophet a liar. I'm calling Moses a liar. And there's this false idolatry that's went through the, the, the kingdom. And we've had it in here. And honestly, it does not, it cannot take root. When you say that you, there's no hell and there's no devil, it's a lie. It's not even just a lie. It is to blind you from what you're walking into. The lie is scurry. The truth, not so scurry. If I know that I have an adversary, and it tells me in 1 Peter 5 8, that he walked us around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, I know that he's not a lion. He walks like a lion. He can't even roar. He's more like a pussycat. He goes, you know, he doesn't have that strength over me. But what happens is we've been caught in the self determinism where we think, look, you know what? The effects of my life are based on the fact that, you know what? This is the way things just go. So, uh, you know, it's okay. I'll just filter into the atmosphere of the world. How scary is it? Honestly, I was talking the other day about the rise of Satanism in the world. Now, when I say the rise of Satanism, there's two elements to this, right? There's those who are hardcore Satanists who believe that um, he's to be worshipped, and then there are those who are worshipping him by default. And this is why this is in the popular message. Because the church of Laodicea, the, the address that goes to that church is that you're lukewarm. I would rather you were hot or cold. In other words, there's no, no room for serving in the middle. You're either serving Christ or you're not. So you're either for Jesus or you're not. The hardcore Satanist, Anton LaVey, I've talked about him before. Anton LaVey, the writer of the Satanic Bible, died I think in 97. His daughters and his children went on to continue this song. But you'll be surprised. Like Anton LaVey started with the Church of Satan. You've also got the Church of Set, which is a derivative of that. You've got the Church of Lucifer. You've got all of this, right? All of this has grown in the last sort of 30 years. But really it goes back about 200 years. Because about 200 years ago, during the 1800s, you had a guy called Darwin come along and say, Look, you know what? We're all just animalistic. We're all just animals. To, to, to equate his teachings, then it meant that you lost the spirit element to you. You lost a bit connected to the divine. And so then it came, well, if I'm just an animal, I might as well follow my animalistic intent. What's the wrong with me sleeping with 10 people? 20 people, 30 people, 40 people. And it became, and honestly, this is the atmosphere that we live in and we see it as normal. But do you understand the church are not meant to be normal? The church, the Greek term is ecclesia. It means to be set aside for power. To be brought out of the world and set aside for power. But your power is taken away from you when you embrace the system of the world. When you're unsanctified, when you don't let yourself become set apart, when you don't let yourself be drawn out, when you say, look, it's all right for me to go and do what I always did because I always did what I always did and it's got me to where I am and I'm quite happy with it and there's no difference in me. I'm just born again, my Picard stop, my passport stop, I'm going to heaven, that's me, I'm happy. Do not tell me you love Jesus if that's you. 1 John 2.15 says that if you love the world and you love the things of the world, that's, to, that's not talking about people. Let's talk about the lusts of your flesh, your eyes, the pride of life. If you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Jesus is calling his children forth. He's calling you forth, and we talked about it last week. He's calling you forth in your identity in him. He's calling you forth saying, this is who you are, child. I called you to be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath, a high king, a high priest, more than a conqueror, an overcomer. That's who I called you. Now come together as a collective body and come out of the world. Show the world that you're sitting on a hill and not some sort of just flickering torch at the bottom of the valley that everybody goes to every now and then on a Sunday and says, I felt good during the songs, but I didn't really come out changed. His presence changes you. His presence will change you from the very core outward. 
Look at how Moses went up the mountain. By the way, maybe you can say that in announcements. We've got our, our, our uh, water our hike on Friday. When Moses went up the mountain and he spent time in the presence of the Father, he didn't come down the same way he went up. He came down and his very countenance was changed. The shine of the Shekinah glory on his face was enough to scare the people. Moses, cover your face up. There's too much glory coming out of you. There's too much change in you. And the change happens when you spend time with the Father. If you go to church and you come out the same way you went in, then either you've got to question the church or you've got to question your own heart and the, the, the condition of the ground to be planted. You've got to question that because honestly, you should be changed in every encounter with Jesus. Every encounter. I want to look at um, Matthew 13. To turn to Matthew 13. We're going to look at the parable of the wheat and the tares. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I've got a lot to say today. The parable of the wheat and the tares is basically there's you, when you, the wheat is planted. The wheat is talking about the church, talking about the believer, and the wheat is planted and is to grow up and to be harvested. In other words, when you are planted, you are judged in one way. Matthew tells you in another another chapter that you are judged by the fruit that you bear. You know what? My kids are like me. They take all characteristics that I have. Like my daughter loves, my eldest daughter, just put that out there, loves thrillers. She loves like detective things. She loves serial killer stuff, right? No, don't, don't judge. But she does. But that comes from me. My two eldest, Brandon and Alyssa, are both uh, third degree black belts. Because they are taking on the, the seeds that are sown, they bear fruit of what is sown. It starts to be evident in, their, in who they are. We are called to be wheat. I'm going to read this quickly. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now this is the verse I want you to take hold of. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. See, the tares come and they're sowed into every church, every family. The tares come and they are intermingled with the wheat. So that when harvest time comes, they are very hard to pull out the wheat without, or pull out the tares without pulling out the wheat too. They intermingle. And I want you to be very aware that this happens in every atmosphere in your life. The enemy, if he sees you going for Christ, if he sees you getting strong, will send across someone who will be a terror in your life. He will send across someone who will try and influence you in one way, shape or other to go counter to the word of God. And you can go, oh, well, you know what? I love that person. But at the same time, you need to be careful about who is speaking into your life. I remember the minute I told my two closest friends that I was born again. And I wasn't just born again, man, I was on fire. I was in love with God. And I was, I was doing this and I was in an atmosphere that I knew wasn't, uh, wasn't productive for my spirit. I knew this atmosphere wasn't something that you know made me feel good and made my spirit comfortable. And when I, when I uttered out this, this admission, when I told them that I loved Jesus, that I was born again, and that I wouldn't be doing or leading the life that I used to lead, I was met with every profanity that I could, someone could think of. I was rebuked, and I remember my heart sitting there breaking. I still love these guys, right? But I was sitting there, and I was going, oh, God, is this the way it is? Is this the way my life has to be? Does this mean because I serve you that I, I will be rejected by the world? The answer is yes. 
And I remember walking home. And I remember the encouragement that I got. And I, I, I did break down. I did sort of have a wee tear in my eye. Because these, these guys were like the loveliest guys. Still love them. But I said something that was counter to the atmosphere of the world. And counter to the atmosphere that I sat in. And I was met with hatred. But I remember the encouragement of Jesus on the walk. I remember walking home and just, just here. You're my child. You're my child. Do not worry when the world turns against you. Recognize that the world will turn against the seed that is sown from heaven. And the world is constantly waiting for you to fall asleep to your walk so that the enemy can come in and see an, al seed, or so, an alternative seed. The seed word, right? In Hebrew it's said, S-E-D. It is the root word for the word that we get, hesed. Now, if, you, if you've heard the word hesed, it's, it's where we get, you've seen Hasidic Jews. I remember taking Brandon to Poland, and we were we were going around the Jewish quarter, and the Hasidic, if you see a Hasidic Jew, they stand out, right? They look different than everyone else. He actually had to tell me off, because I, you know you're in those like, drive around, they're like wee carts, you're doing the tour, but it's just a glass, sort of like shower curtain in between, but I have this thing, you know, I'm in the car, so nobody can see me, and a Hasidic Jew was just right there, and I pointed, and I said, look Brandon, look, and he, you know, embarrassed, but it's because they stand out in how they look, and the reason they stand out in how they look, Hasidic is based on the word Hesed, Hesed is the word Love or charity is the same that we see in 1 Corinthians 13. And we read it in the Greek as agape. It is God love. These people change their appearance to stand out because the type of seed that is sown into your life if you're a believer in Jesus Christ is one that is different than the world sows. You're meant to stand out. You're meant to be different than the world. And don't be afraid if the world hates you as a consequence. Whenever you're trying to fit in with the world, you will take that seed and you will bring it along with wheat and tear it together and it will be a counterfeit, compromised gospel. This week, on TikTok, now that I'm on TikTok, right? A pastor, a pastor, mind you, gave a short sermon. And do you want to know what the title is? And I listened to the whole sermon, and it does not get better. Jesus was a racist. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm hitting the court. This is pastors seeking their own popularity to fit in with the culture of the day by attacking God himself. I watched them. Jesus was a racist. Are you serious? Like, I can get really fired up with this because honestly, I'm disgusted by the world and what we quantify and qualify as church. And this isn't popular because you come to church, you want to go, here, come on, Pastor, give me a happy, happy, feel good message, and I can go out and I can go about my day and feel good about who I am. But that doesn't bring change. If I have one person to preach to, and they go out of here different than when they came in, then I know I will stand in front of my Father in heaven and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We need to be changed in his presence. If you're still, you know, I know guys who have been saved for like 20, 30 years and they are still the same as the day you met. They're not growing in Christ. And it's not that they haven't grown in knowledge. It's not that they haven't grown in the amount of times they went to church. It's not that they don't pray. It's not that they don't read. It's that they never take, a quality, take an objective look at how many tours are drowning out the, the seeds or the wheat in their life. Honestly, 65% of the church do not believe there's a devil. That means that you're watering down the word to the point that it is just, it's just a, a little bit. It doesn't have any power. 
serious? Do you understand you're stepping into his plan? They, when we talked about the third temple being uh, on its way, and it, it, it's already like, when I say that, that Saudi Arabia have supported the claim, don't, uh, don't take it like, you know, well, then that's just the start of things. There's a whole uh, Jewish temple institute that has got everything in place ready to go at the drop of a hat. And then this guy will come in and claim this as his area, his throne. You see, he needs an atmosphere before he can set up a throne. He needs a people terraformed to his way of thinking before he can set up his throne. Like you go into a church today and they, they will refuse to speak against, like sin is a bad word now in a church. Are you, are you flipping serious? Sin being, oh, we can't mention sin. We want to make sure everybody goes out here knowing that God loves them. Yes, God loves you enough to rebuke you. Revelation 3.19 tells us that. For those he loves, he rebukes and he chastens. He doesn't go here. It's okay that you know, you're taking dope at the weekend. You're jumping into bed with uh, Sally and Henry and Jim and Joe. You're just doing all that and then you're going out and you're taking other drugs. It's just because as long as you just love me. Listen, love is not a word, it's an action. You can turn around and you've all been in relationships where someone has said, I love you. But it's an action, it's not a word. What I mean by that, if love is just done in the sense that, you know, here, I love you, I love you, I love you, you will find out that the ability of someone to say it and not mean it is so easy. But love is expressed in action. When I love Jesus, I deny the things of this world. When I love Jesus, I deny the atmosphere and step against and step out of the atmosphere that I'm in. This this seed, this seed is being sown at night. Do you understand that if you look at what happens even with media, if someone, if a child is born today, by the time they reach 18, they've watched 200,000 acts of violence, rape, and abuse. All through TV. I'm not telling you to throw your TV out. We need some discernment here as a church. 200,000. Oh, it doesn't have an effect on them. Are you serious? Tell me this, have you ever been to, a, when before you were saved, have you ever went to a bar or an atmosphere with someone and you find that your moral line was compromised because of who you were with? You maybe wouldn't speak a certain way, but because you're with that person, he says, that's oh, all right, sure, everybody's doing it. You tell me that if a child has watched that much, infiltrate through their eye gate, that they're not going to be changed. Lot. It says when Lot split from Abraham, when they divided up their goods, their land, and their, their, their wealth, Lot inclined his tent towards Sodom. In other words, he turned his tent towards the place that represented the most debauchery in the land. And he watched it. He just looked at it. And once it goes in through your eye gate so many times, eventually it becomes, well, it's all right. And when it becomes okay, then it's okay to embrace it. Then you step into it. And then before you know it, you're one of the top guys in song. That's scurry that that's the case. And that's scurry that the church are going wildly and close, so close into this. When we are told that our walk is to deny ourself. Luke 9, 23 tells me I'm to deny to do every believer is to deny himself and take up his cross. Galatians 2.20 says we have been crucified with Christ Jesus. Romans 12.1 tells me that I'm to be a living sacrifice. In other words, the atmosphere of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, try and grab my attention, say, here, come and do it, come and join in, it's okay. And listen, I don't care what you say, and neither does Jesus, not so much to the point that that's where he's basing your faith system on. He's basing your faith system and how much you believe in him on your works. Not talking about works to get into heaven. I'm talking about your faith is an action. It's an action. 
Your faith is in action. He says, and through the whole way through Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, I know your works. Oida. It means he personally knows. So the thing that you're doing behind closed doors when you think it's okay because the whole world does it, he knows. It says in Revelation 1, and Revelation 2, it says in Revelation 1, Jesus, Yeshua, stands in the midst of the church. The church is. That means every church, every believer, he's in our midst. It tells us in Revelation 2 that he walks amongst us. Imagine him walking amongst us right now. Imagine him walking amongst us and when you're at home and he hears you gossiping about so and so. Speaking ill of someone else. That is not dying to yourself. That is promoting self ahead of God. And let me tell you, the seed that Satan sows is very clearly self. That's what it is. Satan sows the seed of self. Because we know that Jesus says, man cannot serve God and mammon. Now mammon we identify as money, but mammon, when you looked at mammon worship, specifically during medieval times, it was the worship of self. I'm a self-made man. I can do things myself. I don't even need God. I can do it myself. That's the atmosphere of pride, and that is the thing that the enemy seeks to sow. And now you've seen it infiltrate the churches so much so that Anton LaVey turned around and said that every religion of the world is coming around to Satanism. Serious. Every religion. When he was questioned on it, he says, why? Well, Satanism is about self. So when you see a minister on stage saying, you want to get rich? Here's the way. If you tithe uh, $52 for 52 weeks of the year, you'll get a 52-fold return. It's all about self. It's what you get out of it as opposed to what you're here for. You're here to die to yourself. And we're living in an atmosphere where opinion is the very promotion of self. That's what I think, so you just take it. No, truth is the dividing line. It's not opinion, it's truth. And it is not self, it is selflessness. It is dying to the very call of the world. Saying, I'm not off this. And if you see it, look, honestly, I, I you know, Jude verse 9 tells us to speak the evil of no dignitary, so I will never ever mention a church leader, a pastor, or anything like that. But you can go on to certain channels, certain TV channels, and you can watch some of the things said, and it is all about self. God is a distant second. Now I'm not in that 36% that don't believe there's a rapture. I know there's a rapture. The Bible tells me so. And I know that he's coming back and he will come like a thief in the night. He will come like a flash of lightning. And we will be caught up in the word in the Greek is atomos. In an instant, in at less than a second, we will be caught up. And at that point, there is no time to consider, well, I should have been less self selfish. The, the compromised church that we were talking about is the infiltration of the seed of self. Whenever we sleep, whenever we slumber, and it tells you in the Bible to be sober and vigilant. In 1 Peter 5, it says be sober and vigilant because the enemy is seeking whom he may devour. What's he doing to devour you? He's coming along and saying, here, have a seat of self. Have a seat of self. Sure, do you know what? There's people who are going starving and you see that you know there's a ministry to sow into, but you know, seriously, you can spend that on yourself. Or do you know what? That person needs my love. But stuff them, they don't agree in me. And you start to live off that platform where self becomes promoted higher than God. Can I just say, you're, that is no different than Satanism. I said at the start, there's two different types. There's those who are openly worshipping Satan and there are those who are worshipping him by default because they have promoted themselves above the call of God to die to yourself. When I die to myself, temptation is the thing of the past. You know, you don't go past, you don't see, you know, drive past Rose Lawn. 
I see everybody sit up every time it's lunchtime because they're hungry and they want to go for a McDonald's. You don't see that because the temptation isn't there for a dead body. And it's the same for you. If you're born again, the temptation dies. That's how Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness of Matthew 4, was able to refrain from everything the enemy threw at him because Jesus was the very picture of submission to the will of the Father. That's what, that's what submission is. When I submit to the will of the Father and I say, His will be done, not mine. We all want to get ahead. We all want to do things. And the, the way Christendom has gone and said, look, do you know what? Let's all get prosperous. Let's call our gospel a prosperity gospel. Let's all get rich. That's not the gospel. Does that mean that Jesus doesn't bless you? No, he blesses you. The Bible tells you that his blessings make one rich and add no sorrow. But the, the, the provocation of it is not for self. The provocation of it is because I can't go past someone who, who I can see is burning, is going to burn in hell and go, well, hold on a minute. You know, I've got more things to do today. You can't do that. The lie of Satanism has infiltrated the whole of the church across the world. Turds have been sown at night that self takes more of a platform than God does. When we sing, are we actually singing to God? Or are we going, hmm, I don't like that song. That's not the type of song I like to sing. Because that's self. When we start to praise him, you could praise him with one word. You could sing out Jesus and Jesus alone. And that could be true, unfiltered, unadulterated praise. Praise isn't equated to the words that you sing. Praise is equated to the heart behind it. Because what we praise is what we take a need to. And we're living in a world where so many people have taken a need to fear. And that's not, that's not trying to minimize what people feel. Fear will knock at every man's door. But you have the choice to let it in. Do you take a knee to it? Or do you take a knee to the spirit of the mighty God? Do you take a knee to what God puts forth? His love, his seat. Is that the seat that is, at, that is ever present in your life? Look at I'm not sure of the time, but I'm going to start to come to a close. Psalm 1. Really, really beautiful psalm. One of my favorites. And Psalm 1 says, We are told to not sit in the seat of the scornful or stand in the ways of the wicked. It says that we are to be like a tree planted by the rivers of living waters. We're to meditate on the word of God day and night. Do you get that day and night? Because at night, it's saying that when we lose focus, it's not talking about physical night. It's talking about when we lose focus on our walk, weeds, terrors will be sown to intermingle with your faith, to intermingle with what you're called to be. And we are told that in this scripture, the whole purpose of this, by us meditating on the word day and night, we are tending our own garden. I say there are people around you who will try and sow in terrors. There are people who will come to ministry that will try and sow in tares. But here's the thing. What happens to the tares is they're bundled together and they're thrown into the fire. There are people who will call upon the name of Jesus and say, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And his words will be away from me for I never knew you. Because who I know is evident in how I walk. My kids are like me because I'm their daddy. 
And we need to be a church that is standing in resistance to the spirit of the world. Standing in the resistance to the seed of self. Standing against the move of the enemy to terraform an atmosphere for him. We need to be like a city on a hill. A light shining, not, not under a bushel. We need to be different. We need to be drawn out of the world and say, look, this is my identity. This is who I am. I am a son of the Most High God. I will not try and defame or twist the scripture to get more likes on TikTok. I don't even know if you're liking TikTok. But I will not do that. Everything that we do needs to be for him. Because honestly, I don't know about you. I do not deserve his love. I just don't. But he loved me anyway. I mean... He didn't just love me to the point that he says, Gary, when you die, you're coming up to my house. I got a mansion for you. I got a place at my table for you. He loves me enough to be in every intimate detail of my life. And I have to go back to the Garden of Eden and think, Adam had that privilege to walk with him, but where Adam messed up, it's Adam didn't keep an eye on the Garden a serpent comes in to tempt his wife and Adam should have been tending the garden because that's what he was placed in the garden to do. We are placed on this earth and we, our job is to tend our own path, our own patch and go, right, hold on a minute. Am I walking in self or selflessness? Am I walking according to the spirit of the world or am I walking according to how my daddy walks? And this, this, is, look, this is a simple message. But my heart is broken for the state of the corporate church. I said on Wednesday, we were talking about Theatria. And there was this spirit of Jezebel in the church. Spirit of perversion, of twisting, of, of lies, and sort of twisting of the scripture. Because Jezebel was allowing people, and people who came to the church, to say, go and worship the spirit of the world. You go back to 2 Kings 9, and this guy called Jehu, and his name is after God's name. Jehu comes along, and he rides right in. He's known as a reckless driver, and he rides right in, and he sees Jezebel standing in the, the window upstairs and his words Jezebel had actually you know what's funny is she was still entrenched in the spirit of the world she had, when she heard Jehu was coming she done her she done her makeup lipstick on eyeliner probably probably her whatever I don't know she was standing up there and Jehu runs in and he doesn't even answer her She asks, are you coming for evil? Are you coming for violence? He doesn't even answer. His words are the same words to Jesus to the church. Who's with me? The eunuchs stand behind her. They went, we're with you, Jehu. And they got rid of Jezebel. The scripture goes on to say that Jezebel's body was ripped apart by dogs. And it says in verse 37 that the blood remained dumb. So her body, her remains remained dumb for the earth. Fertilizer for the earth. I'm telling you, there's a fertilizer that is coming, that is needed for the stance of revival in this world. And that fertilizer is saying no more to compromise. I believe the fullness of the word of God. When Jesus said, I saw Lucifer fall from heaven, I believe that. When Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by Satan, I believe that. When it says that he, he tempted Job, I believe that. When it says in 1 Peter that he is, a, he is walking around like a roaring lion, I believe that. When it says in Revelation 12, which is a dragon, I believe that. I know there's an adversary. I know he's trying to sow seeds of self, but I am going to remain unburdened by that and say, I will pour out my life, Lord, for you. Remove from me the points of self that go, I just, this is how I feel and that's what I want to do. Remove that from me because that's what revival is built upon. When a church, when a body says, God, we reject 
the spirit of the world and solely accept your word. Guys, stand for me. I want to pray with you. Let me tell you, I did mention, Gally, don't be wandering off, please. I did mention, the other way, I did mention Anton LaVey. And I said that he had, he had said that every religion is coming around to Satanism. Every religion coming around to self. But you know what his last words were? Oh no. Everything's all wrong. The last words of the father of the, the guy who was identified as the Paul of Satanism was, oh no, it's all wrong. There are people who will go to hell because we don't speak up. There will be people who embrace the spirit of the world because we keep the spirit of God suppressed. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not quench the spirit of God. So I'm saying right now, I'm going to speak boldness into your life. And if you're ready, you accept it. But listen, boldness is nothing without obedience. Bow your heads, close your eyes, stick your hands out for me, please, and get ready to receive. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, our King and Messiah, I speak a boldness, a spirit of boldness that will not be quiet when the, the fake, roaring lion comes along. That will not be quiet, will not be subservient to the spirit of the world, but will say, no, Lord, I stand not among the fence, not over the fence, not straddling the fence. I stand purely on your side. Lord, you have called me forth. You have said, who is with me? And I raise my hand right now in the name of Jesus and I say, I am with you. I lay it all out before you. If every part of myself has to die, then I will do it, Lord, because I choose, I choose to lay it all before you. All of you and none, none not one bit of me. Lord, tear apart those parts of me that are holding on to myself, that are holding on to my own will. And Lord, I want to lay it all out before you because I know only in your presence, only in your leading, is this life worth living. And is this the, the walk of a victor? And Lord, will you call us to be the victor and not the victim? We are going to keep guard of our garden. We are going to say no more seeds of self being sown. And only the seeds of faith in you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Kelly, don't go. Can I invite the worship team up? I know it's Mother's Day and uh, the kids are doing stuff. Uh, but also on Tuesday, there's a special birthday. And she hates being embarrassed. She is entering into the same decade as me. Um, I know she looks older, but it's all right. Um, so Kelly will be 40 on Tuesday. So can we all sing happy birthday? Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday Loving husband, too. She won't talk to me all day now. So, <laughs> guys, we're going to worship. We're going to take up an offering, and I think there's some things coming in for the kids.